I've been anticipating this day for a long time. Finally, we've reached critical mass. The amount of used enterprise server flash memory on the market is uh, a lot. And so you can take cast off enterprise flash, flash storage, one, two, four, eight terabyte drives, and build a really kick butt NAS. It's all flash, it's all solid state. And uh, without breaking the bank, and it doesn't consume a ton of power, and it doesn't run hot, and it's 3D printable if you want. Let's take a look. Now I did a 3D printable NAS with a high-end enterprise SAS flash from Keoxia, but that's modern, insanely fast SAS flash. But that was really preparation for this, which is you can get this HGST. This is from 2018. This is also SAS flash, but this is an eight terabyte SAS flash drive that costs some company thousands upon thousands of dollars. But this is a surplus now. Uh, this particular one came from server part deals. Uh, our Samsung, this is an E1 drive. This also came from server part deals. I paid for this. This one, this is our HP SAS flash drive. Now I thought I was gonna be able to do this video years ago because there was an absolute flood of these SAS flash drives, this two terabyte drive. It turns out it has a firmware bug that when it's been on for 32,000 hours, it self breaks. And that's why there was a flood of these on the market years ago. In fact, there's a really popular forum on the thread about reformatting these from uh, 528 bytes per sector to 512 bytes per sector. And this is another thing that kind of intersects a popular thing on this channel. When we talk about RAID and the data integrity thing, everybody will tell me that, oh, you're, you're wrong about data integrity on drives. It's up to the drive to manage its own integrity. 32,000 hours, oh, that's a black swan event. But 528 bytes, 528 bytes versus 512 bytes. The whole idea with 520 or 528 byte sectors versus 512 is the extra eight or 16 bytes would contain an extra checksum so that the controller could immediately challenge and verify that the information written to the disk is inconsistent with the information returned from the disk. This is not unlike ZFS uh, checksumming, but that's built at the file system level and so it can use 512 byte sectors. Now modern flash is 4K and the reality is that a lot of this is 4K. Our Samsung E1 drive, this is definitely 4K. Our HGST SAS here under the hood is actually 4K. It will present 512 bytes. It'll let you use it like 512 bytes, but really you should format it at 4K because under the hood, it's 4K. And the performance of these SAS drives is really not great compared to modern SAS drives. Uh, and they have a lot of wear on them because 2018, I mean, obviously the, the organization that's been using these has gotten five to seven years of use out of this, but it doesn't matter because we can build a really kick-ass network storage device out of a bunch of these. Sometimes you get lucky. This one is SATA. This is a Micron, a 960 gig SSD. 960 gig, yeah, you'll run into weird sizes sometimes in the enterprise. This 960 gig is actually a terabyte under the hood, but it is a small size because it reserves some capacity for wear leveling, which means that these drives, even though they're older enterprise drives, typically have crazy endurance. Our HGST drives, they have really solid endurance, but, um, you know, they may or may not be used. We'll, we'll talk about how to check that in just a minute with uh, Smart Utils. There's also a thread for this, a forum thread on uh, level one forum that you might want to check out. So you can, you know, inventory your drives when you get them in. Use smart diagnostics, run smart tools on them and find out how much wear leveling you have. Speaking of odd sizes, this is a Keoxia drive, but it's actually a Hewlett Packard Enterprise stick, sticker. And this is a KPM6. This is 3.2 terabytes. This is actually a four terabyte drive, but it only gives you access to 3.2 terabytes of capacity because the other 800 gigabytes is for wire leveling. This drive has an insane endurance and it comes with an HP Caddy. This is the kind of stuff that you'll get at Surplus and from serverpartdeals.com. So be not afraid. Now it can be difficult to tell the connector from SAS versus NVMe at first look. You have to look at the drive and look at the sticker to find out if the drive is SAS or NVMe. SAS actually normally has less pins, but because the production rate of SAS drives now is lower than NVMe and they're physically compatible a lot of the time, 
it'll, they'll just use the same physical connector. SAS and NVMe both have an extra set of gold pins on a raised area on the bottom. NVMe typically has a ton of pins on the top edge of the connector, whereas SAS only has a few on the top edge of the connector. It's a big difference. This is a Samsung PM1633. This is another drive. This is four terabytes that I was able to pick up. And typically, these drives are gonna be on the order of about $50 a terabyte, $60, $75 a terabyte, depending. Depending on the wire leveling, if you get some drives that are in particularly good shape, maybe a little more. We're not gonna talk too much about software in this in this video, uh, really just hardware setup, because you can deploy TrueNAS, you can do TrueNAS Core or TrueNAS Scale or Unraid. We've got a lot of older content about those kinds of things. You can also ask questions in the level one forums. Now, if it is a SAS drive, you'll need a controller. And I've got just the perfect thing. Now, this is a wildly expensive case. This is Sliger, but I love it because it's got a handle. It's been featured in a lot of other videos. It has a bifurcation adapter in it. You can get these on eBay for 50, 60, 75 dollars, something like that. Sometimes even a little cheaper. What it does is it'll take your X16 physical slot and give you two X8 slots. This one's a 9300 16i. 16i means that it has 16 internal ports. It also has an extra power input because it does use quite a bit of power. These are designed for servers and they're designed for a lot of airflow. So you will need an active fan pointed at this thing to keep it from running cool. If you don't, it'll still work anyway, but it will die prematurely. And that is very bad and unfortunate. This thing will speak SATA and SAS. And so using this with SATA or SAS is pretty straightforward. The square connector, this is a SAS type connector. Sometimes you see these on motherboards, even for PCIe. The different electrical signals don't imply compatibility necessarily. This will not work with an NVMe type disc. If you are thinking about building something with NVMe, you got a lot of M.2 laying around. IC Dock has these adapters to go from M.2 to U.2. And so this is a nice seven ish, seven and a half millimeter. Uh, enclosure that includes a nice heat sink for M.2. And so if I take the heat sink off here, we can see that I've got a Samsung 980 Pro one terabyte in here. These are pretty zippy and you could reasonably deploy four or eight of these on a system. Most often you're gonna be better off building a Threadripper system, especially like maybe a Threadripper 3000 series, something that has a lot of PCIe lanes and turning those PCIe lanes into direct connections for these. Um, when you do that, you don't really need a U.2 adapter because you can get PCIe cards that give you four M.2 on board. And then you can put two or three of those in a system with X16 lanes and then there's your NAS. A setup like this is ITX and I think more appropriate and more low cost. I actually think that SAS is a little easier to deal with if you're looking to not spend a lot of money. And so um, when you're going the SAS route, you can just add a controller to a system like this. This is ITX, but I've taken the one slot on the ITX platform and used the bifurcation adapter to have two. And so I can put a high-speed network card in here, 10 or 25 gigabit, and my SAS controller. And that'll support up to 16 drives. Plus I can use whatever's on board the motherboard as a boot drive. And so I've got another two or four connections there, or I can have an M.2 or U.2 connection or breakouts for like my E1 this is an adapter that adapts E1 to uh, U.2, and so now my E1 NVMe is a U.2 NVMe, and so I can just plug a cable into that and then connect this to an M.2, and if I haven't wasted a bunch of money on adapters, then this is a perfectly reasonable way to get four or eight terabytes of NVMe connectivity in here, because this is a PCIe type interface as opposed to SAS. Now, if you're looking for a low cost option, motherboard wise, Minis Forum has several. And so like this Minis Forum motherboard does support PCIe bifurcation. Not all of them do, most of them do at this point. Some need a BIOS update in order to do the PCIe bifurcation, but you set a software option. If you want your X16 slot to be X4, 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 or X8, X8, or X8, X4, X4, and then you can use a ribbon cable or a breakout board like I did in their Sliger case to go from X16 to 2 X8, X8. And then you can plug in two PCIe peripherals, even though it's a mini ITX motherboard that physically only has one slot. Now I know what you're thinking. Sliger case, kind of expensive. This looks like an expensive ITX system. This was there the whole time. This is the same case that I used in the video a long time ago, but you can mount your ITX motherboard here, load up your SAS drives in the front, 
And this thing will support up to eight SAS drives, eight SAS connections. And you can easily do that with a card like this. Now this is, this case is really designed for half height cards, it's a full height card. So I should probably do some revisions to my 3D printable case. But this is all you need to know to get started looking on eBay or hitting up server part deals or whatever to build a fully flash based NAS. Now what you could do with a NAS is a lot of, there's, there's, there's no end of things that you can do with a NAS. You can have it host your media, sure that's what everybody does, that's sort of the boring pedestrian option. But you can also do home automation, home assistant, and start getting into home automation stuff. You can tie it in with your security system and cameras if you have cameras to prevent the footage from going to the cloud, but also giving you some options to do intelligent video analysis, but locally and in a privacy preserving way, not just for you, but also your neighbors and everybody else, and really start your home lab journey, but in a way that's not loud and doesn't consume a lot of electricity and isn't really a huge headache because these one terabyte SATA micron drives use basically zero power when they're idle. It's not, it's not really zero, but it's an absurdly small number. This LSI RAID card, this is using more power than the entire rest of the system because this was designed for a server, it's never designed to go to sleep, it's never designed to save power, and it's always designed to go as fast as it possibly can, which in this case is 1.2 gigabytes per second per channel, and uh, there's 16 of those channels here, so uh, it'll, it'll do a pretty good job saturating a PCI uh, three by eight connection uh, on a, on <laughs> when the sun and the moon and everything are basically aligned and the buffers are full and you're hitting it uh, as fast as you possibly can. So I don't think I'm suggesting that your power utilization of your system is gonna be like eight watts. It's not gonna be that good. But it is gonna be well under what you would enjoy for a system that had a lot of mechanical hard drives. Motherboards like these, this is a W680D4U and this is the Supermicro X13 SAE. This is some Intel love in this video. Generally, I recommend AMD for this use case. It's low power, it's absurd amount of horsepower. But uh, these are true server class motherboards, but for desktop class processors. And the reason these are uh, readily available on the secondary market is because Intel had so much problems with their 13th and 14th gen CPUs, which is what these are designed for. And because these boards have true out of band management, they have true remote management capability, they're gonna use kind of a lot of power at idle, you know, on the order of 45, 50 watts just for the board. Then you add all of your other stuff and you know, you can have a system that's idling just under hundred watts, which is fantastic in the context of a server but maybe not fantastic if you're sensitive to power utilization for things in general. You can build something like this from a mini swarm motherboard and get your idle consumption ceiling more at like 40 or 45 watts as opposed to the floor here being like 60 to 80 watts by the time you get the entire rest of the system built. That also changes too if you, if you had a GPU for doing a local AI and, and large language processing models and stuff like that. We've done a lot of videos on that too. If you're, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Um, you should check out those videos. So one of the first gotchas or one of the first practical problems you run into is that a lot of the time the cables you get to go from the SAS controller to a breakout, it looks like an ordinary SATA connection. And this can work, but really this type of connection is not meant to go to the drive, it's meant to go to a backplane or an enclosure like this. You can get these on eBay for $25 typically. This one's five bay, there's five connections at the back. These are SATA compatible, but they also work with the SAS protocol. And so you can plug this into this. If you don't want to do that, if you want to go straight into the drives, which is what I did for this 3D printable enclosure, there's another kind of cable that looks like this. And it'll break out into four of these, but this one connector supplies both power, and this is a Molex adapter, and the SAS connection. And so you can use this to go straight into the drive without a backplane or an enclosure or anything. Now our HGST drives have a particular interesting kind of defect, and that is they only want five and 12 volts. They do not want 3.3 .3 volts. Um, there's a popular thing in building these NASAs from mechanical hard drives called shucking. It's like, oh, you buy an external USB hard drive because those are cheaper than physical internal mechanical hard drives for some reason. So you buy a USB hard drive and you shuck it. You take it out of its enclosure and then you use it in your NAS. It's a popular thing to do. A lot of those drives use the 3.3 volt, volt pin as a sense pin, which is a thing that happens in enterprise drives, like this one from 2018. This is not really a problem on modern drives for the most part, but if you have the 3.3 volt connected to this drive, it will not work. 
You can add tape to the connector and that just makes it fit weird. I mean, you have to use captain tape, which is really thin and I really wouldn't recommend that. Instead, you could just use a Molex to SATA adapter. These naturally don't have the 3.3 volt pin. And in this case, using that with our special SAS cable that has the, the full size connector, the full SAS connector, our uh, HDST drives show up and work just fine. Our Samsung PM1633 suffered much the same way as our Hitachi drives did, and it was 520 bytes, so it was on hard mode. Fortunately, somebody wrote a forum post on how to do this like 50 years ago, and so just ran that, format it. The dmessage kernel output shows us which SCSI generic device it is, SG whatever, um, and so SG4 format, and it's 1.48% uh, done. So it's gonna take a little while to format. But hey, I'll take it, it's flash storage. 3D printable, NAS, Mini's form motherboard that supports bifurcation. SAS is an option, but if you go SAS, it's not gonna plug directly into the motherboard. You gotta go through a controller, you need a PCIe controller like this. But if you had an eight bay NAS like this, and you had four terabyte SAS drives, 32 terabytes raw, you're gonna have like 25 to 28 terabytes usable on this kind of a platform. That's kind of a lot and it is absurdly fast. And it's worth having if you have, you know, a 10 or 25 gig network. 25 gig NICs are pretty easy to come by. 25 gig NICs a lot of the time are often cheaper um, than a 10 gig, but you will have to have a fiber optic connection. You could have your NAS have a copper connection for most of your network and a optical connection for the rest of the machines of the network. That would be completely fine. You could do that, have multiple NICs in there. Use the onboard NIC on your ITX motherboard for all your other machines and then use that second X8 slot for a fiber optic NIC directly to your main workstation. Help several other creators do that. It's a perfectly reasonable way to approach that so that you don't have to invest in a 25 gigabit switch. Um, and it's low cost, like the rest of the ideas in this video. Think about it. Let's see your build. Take some pictures. Plan it out on the forum. Hit me up there. Now, am this level one. This is just some thoughts that, hey, SAS Flash has entered uh, some availability and don't be intimidated by SAS Flash and you can build your next all flash NAS around it, which is exciting. All right, I'm Wendell, this level one, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.